Anthroposme and then I will give some examples of the Anthropocene feminism to, I, I mean, it was a conference that was held at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I will give some examples of the topics that were covered in that conference about the Anthropocene feminism. And then I will go into uh, the, the, the Anthropocene, the colonial feminisms, and the Anthropocene. What articulations can we make between them? Okay, so it's funny because when I, I, I mentioned the Anthropocene in Brazil, nobody knows what it is. But I, here I think that you have some good idea of what the Anthropocene means. So, uh, so you're probably aware of it. But uh, it, uh, even though you may be aware, I'll go into some of the uh, definitions of the Anthropocene. Uh, it's a name for a new geologic epoch. Epoch? Epoch. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I put the Google translation just to hear how to pronounce some words. Yes. Epoch. <laughs> so it's a new geological epoch, one defined by our own massive impact on the planet. When human beings are not only biological beings, but most importantly are also considered as geological ones. So human beings are now considered geological beings, not only biological ones. Uh, from the Wikipedia, the definition of the Anthropocene is an informal geological chronological term for the propo proposed epoch following the Holocene that began when human activities had significant global impact on the Earth's ecosystem. The impacts that humanity has caused on the planet through the burning of fossil, production of animal stock, and other devastating actions uh, for the ecosystem are of a geophysical dimension comparable to the asteroid that wiped out terrestrial life or the supervolcanoes that covered the skies of the planet with the clouds. I mean, these are the, the two major geological impacts, and the Anthropocene is having another major geological impact. This impact is called the Anthropocene. According to many geologists, the Anthropocene is the global spread of geological phenomena that had not been seen before in the history of 4.5 billion years of the planet, and the effects of which, in many cases, will last millions of, millions of years. The concept thus reflects our interaction with the planet and allows us to consider the consequences of our collective actions in the context of the deep time of the history of the Earth. The conquest of nature that goes back to the 17th century's view of the planet as an enemy to be tamed and indigenous lands and peoples to be ransacked and subdued uh, can be seen as the initial unfolding of the Anthropocene era, which officially begins with the Industrial Revolution for some geologists or in the aftermath of the Second World War for other geologists. So there's a debate when it exactly uh, begins. Uh, since humanity and humanism, anchored in the nature-cultural dualism, is to blame for the Anthropocene, separation of nature, culture, and then the taming of the conquest of nature that such a dualism allows, so, uh, so the humanity and humanism anchored in the nature-culture dualism is to blame for the Anthropocene with its view of nature as, uh, as being at the service of man, sick. The post-human has emerged as a needed and belated antidote, along with talks about self, the body, transcorporeality, uh, and materiality outside of a humanistic perspective, giving no humans the status of actants with the capacity to act differently from how they are already known. 
I just read this, that the number of microbes we have in our bodies uh, far exceeds the number of bodily cells. That's what they call, that's why it's the gross. concept of <laughs> transcorporeality <laughs> is important. It's gross. Yes. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, number the number of bodily cells, the number of microbes, oh. such as bacteria, far exceed the number of bodily cells. Mm -hmm. It's really <laughs> scary. <laughs> <laughs> Haraway, in her Companion Species Manifesto, claims that cyborgs and companion species each brings together the human and the non-human, the organic and the technological, carbon and silicon, freedom and structure, history and myth, the rich and the poor, the state and the subject. Very hard way. Uh, <laughs> subject diversity and depletion, modernity and postmodernity, nature and culture in unexpected ways. In articulating the concept of nature cultures, that what she does in order to contest and undermine the dualism between nature and culture is putting the, these two words together, nature cultures. In articulating the concept of nature cultures, Haraway also brings to the human, non-human relations, an effective dimension that challenges dominant knowledge practices. Uh, some authors have argued that the relations between the human and the non-human, including animals, microbes, tissues, air, and water, affect process and practices, not just in the creation of new societies, but also in the production of scientific knowledge and understanding. So there is this whole discourse about how the materiality of things affect also the knowledge being produced. Uh, the, the book by Janet Bennett, uh, Vibrant Matter, is a case in point. That she Affect here, they explain, must not be understood as solely individuated emotion and sentiment, nor even in the sense articulated by post-representational theories of affect, but rather in terms of, on the one hand, attachment, a relational notion, and on the other hand, in terms of being moved. So affect has these two meanings attachment, relational, and being moved. And, and I'm towards the end of my presentation, I want to show an example of affect, of being, you know, uh, uh, attached to something and also being moved. We are all attached to materials and other beings through relations that are both partial and provisional, like uh, the people work with the post-human say, are saying that we are alongside others and not being with others. So these are the partial connections and relations. To include the non-human as an active in the production of knowledge and in the construction of worlds is, sent, is the central claim of post-human philosophies. I find that uh, Ro Rosie Bridot's book, The Post-Human, uh, is a must reading for whoever is interested in post-humanism and post-human philosophies. Haraway's act of colla collapsing the nature-culture dualism into nature cultures is an attempt to explore how we are one element among many others in nature cultures. We are, it's not that we are, you know, we are in constant relation, our biology with, you know, our nature, biological nature with our cultural nature. But she says that this nature cultures reveals that we are a site of nature cultures, not just an interaction between biology and technology. According to Isabel Stengers, it's a mistake to posit humanity as somehow separate from and or existing prior to the world of things. The human comes into being with this world, alongside this world. 
Thus, nature cultures becomes an important concept to think about the Anthropocene, because besides deconstructing the dualism at the foundation of Western modernity, body, mind, subject, object, it also brackets uh, the human and the environment dichotomous relation. So the human, the environment, body, matter, subject, object. Because humanism in destabilizing the centrality of the human and the notion of a bounded body also dislodges the centrality of the alleged singular human attributes such as language, consciousness, and cognition. There is very interesting work being done on posthumanism and language, for instance. We are, in short, interspecies. This term refers to relationship between different forms of biosocial life and their political effects. We are definitely done and over with human exceptionalism. These new forays into new conceptualizations of human-no-human -human relations were in large part a consequence of the disastrous geological imprint man, sick, is living on the planet that has inaugurated the Anthropocene era. As we all know, the conquest of nature has been a hallmark of Western civilization. Uh, and let's now go to some examples of what could be the Anthropocene feminism. Uh, there was this major conference held at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee in April of 2014, or and uh, to you know to bring the, to uh, how how is that to discussions to bring together bring together but I wanted a stronger <laughs> bring together <laughs> discussions <laughs> about Anthropocene feminism. The purpose of the event was to explore how feminists have been concerned in many ways with the Anthropocene avant la lettre. The key question posed by the conference organized was how feminism in the Anthropocene era should relate to the non-human world. Among the topics included for the papers, for the call for papers for the conference were feminist genealogies and epistemologies of the Anthropocene queer nature, queer ecology, queer Anthropocene, environmental racism, the geographical relation between degraded environments and minority and low income population, uh, new materialism, and Anthropocene feminism after capitalism. Haraway doesn't talk about the Anthropocene. She refers to the Anthropocene as the capitalocene. But the Anthropocene is very much also a result of capitalism. Uh, just an observation, in, in later that year, in 2014, in Rio de Janeiro, a conference held by the Museu de Antropologia at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, entitled The Many Names of Gaia, uh, did not feature any discussion on feminism and the Anthropocene. The only person that was a feminist that they invited was Donna Haraway, but she couldn't participate because, you know, talk, uh, I heard through the vibe, what the is grape vine. the, the grape grape vines grape. that she canceled because one of her dogs got sick. So. <laughs> <laughs> So she didn't attend, but it, she was the only feminist in the whole list of keynote speakers, among whom was Bruno Latour and Isabel Stengers, and you know. So I found that very telling about discussion of the Anthropocene in Brazil. Back to the Milwaukee Conference, uh, perusing the abstracts in the internet site of the event, here are some examples of works on Anthropocene feminism. And I'll give you some examples of papers that were presented. There was one that said, the declaration and entrance into the Anthropocene 
demands a feminism which responds to geophysical forces and materials in and through which social life is formed. This includes empirical and theoretical engagements with the forces and powers shared and lost between the body of the earth and various social <coughs> collective bodies. Lodged in between these bodies, new political formations, what Stacey Alimos calls insurgent vulnerabilities, are also generated. So there is this notion that between the bodies of collective, uh, between collective social bodies and the bodies of the earth, comes forth what is called as insurgent vulnerability, people trying to uh, contest the, the environmental damage, I mean, people trying to resist uh, the environmental damage that this encounter between bodies may cause. A feminist geophilosophy for the Anthropocene encourages forays into the material composition and decomposition of gender, race, and white privilege. Another paper was uh, wanted to analyze the recent realist and science fiction narratives to argue that faced with the possibility of our own extinction in the 21st century, we are witnessing a shift to what one might call an anthropocinematic, anthropocinematic aesthetics in cinema, which shared feminist post-cyborg theory sensitivities and relationships among human, non-human, and nature. So there are all kinds of, you know, new, uh, new uh, forays into this anthropocinematic aesthetic. And I will have, I will show you some of the visual representations of the Anthropocene. Links between both feminism and the Anthropocene can be traced to anti-imperialist resistance with feminism highlighting the link between economic and gender exploitation. This is another example of Anthropocene feminism. And in the US, another example, climate change literature has omitted considerations of the material realities of climate change as experienced by women, children, elders, non-human animals, and two-thirds of the world. Both material feminism and climate justice movement regularly ignore the findings of feminist animal studies which expose the contributions of intensive animal agriculture to climate change and propose the voluntary adoption of vegan diets among the world's heaviest overconsumers. For instance, the US, Canada, and Australia. I'm not quite read for veganism. If you're in Brazil, you can keep eating meat. That's the most. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Bringing together the diverse pers perspectives of ecofeminism, uh, feminist animal studies, material feminism, postcolonial ecocriticism, the author proposed a more inclusive story for understanding, teaching, and responding to climate change. So it requires really to be very uh, transdisciplinary, to go into geological studies, eco-criticism, material <coughs> feminism, in order to understand the issues that you know uh, arise from our, from the human, our interactions between human and human world and material world. Some feminist visual artists are also exploring the Anthropocene. Stacey Alimo, in her article about insurgent vulnerabilities, discusses the photograph ice pedestals, pedestals, pedestais, Pedestal. ice Pedestal. pedestals by the artist Kirsten Justice. Uh, An insurgent vulnerability for Alimo is a recognition of our material interconnection with the wider environment that impels ethical and political response. In part of a feminist response to global climate change, 
it's part of a feminist response to global climate change insofar as it counters the hegemonic masculinity of aggressive consumption. So I want to show you some of the photographs. <laughs> there is a fourth missing in this picture. This is a animal feminism. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can. Uh, <laughs> there is the ice pedestal. Uh, the the photo here, the body appears darker than it's in the photograph. It's much lighter body. So she talks uh, a limo analyzing this uh, photograph says in this one. What we see is a melting pedestal that is evoking a massive storm caused by, you know, global warming. And uh, it, as all that is solid melts into the ver melts away and the very ground disappears, the woman nakedness it speaks of human <coughs> exposure and openness to the material world in which we we are immersed. So she analyzed that as, you know, she reads the photograph in that way. And then there is a second photograph, I spat as two, in which she says, well, the woman is embracing the pedestal, exhibiting protection and care. Uh, even, in, even being in that child's, you know, uh, pose. And she says, whereas the naked body performs vulnerability, the thick black boots and gloves punctuate the performance with insurgent and insurgence and strength. So, and finally, the third one. Uh, this uh, the, the figure, the naked figure, uh, in that pose, like it's protecting, right? It's self-protective, with arms crossed in front of the body, as the figure's hair blends perfectly with the eyes. However, the image suggests that defending oneself and defending the environment are the self-same gestures, extending body to place. So, that's... <laughs> I saw this person in her hand to the other day. <laughs> 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 <Front of words. laughs> in conclusion, for a line on the ice pedestal series, embodies a feminist stance towards environmentalism, an insistent on what many feminists call transcorporeality, the recognition of the substantial interconnection between human corporeality and the more than human world. Um, however, uh, looking at these three photographs, the images evoke tellingly a very white world. That's why I told you the images are in the pictures much whi whiter than they are <coughs> being projected. So, uh, if we uh, if we underscore the intersection between race, gender, and sexuality, we can perhaps deploy a quite more effective critique of the Anthropocene and its universalizing discourse that is all white. It tends to be a very white discourse. This is where I want to bring the colonial feminism into the Anthropocene. Try to make that art articulation. Uh, first of all, I came across the debates on the Anthropocene through a very tortuous trajectory. It was by way of reading about a, a Meridian perspectivist notion of equivocation, which is embedded in translation and the colonial feminism's debate on gender and race. When I was on sabbatical here in 2011 and 2012, I also had the chance to present my interpretation of what I saw as a way out of the feminist dilemma concerning whether gender was or, or was not a colonizing category. 
because there is a whole debate. One says gender is a colonizing category, and another Lugoni says that, and then Rita Segato says no, their gender was already present in, in, in the Yoruba people even before colonization. So there is a whole debate about this, uh, about the category. And I found that the notion of equivocation in a meridian perspectivism spelled out by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro proved to be quite useful in articulating the idea of gender as an equivocal category along with other categories of difference. Equivocal in the sense that they seem to be pointing to the same thing, but they are not. And these are equivocal categories, not that you have to overcome their equivocality, but to explore their equivocality. So I had a, a paper published about this, and so I was reading about equivocation, and then it took me to, uh, to readings about, you know, uh, how forests think and, uh, you know, deconstructing the nature, uh, uh, cultural dichotomy, and the work of Marisol de la Cadena, Isabel Stengers, Bruno Latour, and many others have shown, proved to be one of the most, th this dichotomy, nature, culture, proved to be one of the most pernicious of all binaries that constitute the bedrock of Western ontology and epistemology. So the colonial epistemologists have revealed how the racing and gendering of the world's population constituted the founding moment of Western modernity coloniality. Unfortunately, I have not encountered so far theoretical discussions by the colonial feminists on the Anthropocene. Not to say that there are not practices like group in the sense of subaltern groups, subaltern subjects, collectives of marginalized population, uh, envi developing environmentally sustainable projects. There are, and there are lots of works that work uh, showing how these collectives are very sensitive to the environment and so forth. But theoretical debates about the Anthropocene, vo feminist voices about the Anthropocene, I haven't seen a lot of even Latin American voices. There are many male voices, but very few feminist voices. As the conference, the several, the many names of Gaia pointed out, there is a conference articulated by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. Uh, so, uh, all the talks about climate change and environment tend to be very undifferentiated as to their gender and race components. There is a problematic we in referring to how we humans are affecting the planet. As one of the Milwaukee Conference papers put it, a politics that builds from such a we can easily tend towards universalizing discourses that threaten to reenact historically persistent, largely gendered violence of erasure that has accompanied transformations around practices of knowledge production. So there is a very problematic we humans discourse on the Anthropocene debate. This is exactly why I think it's high time for the colonial feminists to intervene in the what has been to a large extent a very Western Anthropocene feminism in defense of Anthropocene's most vulnerable <coughs> victims, poor, marginal, and racially marked women. Uh, I'd like to conclude with an image taken from Nicholas Mirzev's, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Mirzev's, <laughs> it's kind of difficult <laughs> article, <laughs> visualizing the Anthropocene published in the, in the journal uh, Public Culture. Let's see it. Okay. Let's see it. It's uh, in this picture, let's see if I can, uh, 
in this picture, ah, uh, no, I have to demin uh, resize it. In this picture, you see this, the first uh, frame is about, uh, about carbon, okay, production of carbon. Look, it's so they increase the areas where carbon is, is high, is very, you know, is, there is heavy concentration in production of carbon. And interesting, in the second frame, we have uh, mortality by, mil by millions of population. So look at the contrast between the first frame and the second frame, and how it's important for us to uh, start you know, questioning the we that the Anthropocene refers to when talking about <coughs> climate change and who is being most affected by these climate changes, okay? Who is affecting and who is the mo most affecting and who is the most affected by the climate Sorry. change? So uh, that's why uh, Nicholas uh, Mursov says that we need to develop counter visualities of the Anthropocene. So in this article, the author asks for counter-visuality of the Anthropocene so as to undermine its, its imperial discourse. As he argues, like all forms of counter-visuality, contesting Anthropocene dominant visuality is a decolonial politics that claims the right to see what there is to be seen and name it as such a planetary destabilization of the conditions supportive of life, requiring a decolonization of the biosphere itself in order to create a new sustainable and more inclusive democratic way of life. Uh, there is an eco-feminist critic, Greta Gard, that observes that we need to look elsewhere to find counter-narratives of climate change to undermine this Western narrative of climate change. And she points that in music videos, hip-hop, in non-Western literature, and creative non-fiction, as well as uh, in diverse social movements. In other words, we need to go beyond the academic talks on the Anthropocene in, in order to find counter-narratives of the Anthropocene. And i like to conclude by bringing an example of how, you know, uh, of a film that has been, uh, been qualified by men as an example of a decolonial film, a decolonial aesthetics. And in this film, what I see in one part of the film that I will show, there is one moment that I managed to understand the whole debate about partial connection, relationalities, the affective, eh, affective dimension of uh, the importance of affect in, in developing these partial connections and how Translation, it's a, a theme that I worked uh, very much on, when translation becomes unnecessary. Okay, so um, I'll show that part of the film, but before, uh, the film is by the Mauritian director, Sisako, entitled Bamako. Have you ever seen Bamako? Yeah. Bamako, okay, consider this the colonial move. It's, uh, as, as the description, Bamako is a film about African civil society taking the World Bank and the IMF to a trial court, blaming them for Africa's woes, the economic inequities of globalization. The trial court is set up in the courtyard of a house that's shared by more than one family. While the court proceedings happen, Daily life goes on in the courtyard, like women uh, bathe children, uh, bathe, uh, wash clothes, cross by the court, you know, the court proceedings are happening, they cross, 
the, the space carrying buckets with dirty clothes to wash and you know it's very funny how one discourse is int interspersed by another you know discourse of everyday life and uh, so they show people going about their daily business and people enter and leave the courtyard as they please and what is interesting in the movie is that uh, there are two culminating moments of the film, and for me the most in, uh, intense and telling ones. The first is when an African witness stands up to testify, but instead of speaking, remains silent for a few seconds and leaves. He goes to testify, he stays before the microphone and leaves. And the second moment is when an old man who had attempted to testify out of his turn several times before, decides that he's not going to anymore wait for his turns. And erupt, just stands up and starts, you know, chanting. That's the way he testifies. It's with a chant. Yeah. So uh, his speech, which is delivered in a chant, lasts for long minutes it is in a language <coughs> other than French. Ma Mali's official language is French. Uh, and th also, it's not in Bambara, the most widely spoken language in Mali. While he chants, the camera, and you'll see, the camera explores the faces of those listening. His speech is not translated in the form. You see, I managed to, I mean, all the, the, the the speeches are translated, but his speech is not translated for us, for those in the courtyard, for the villagers outside. And it's clear that although we and everyone else in the courtyard do not understand the words being uttered, we feel deeply what the old man means. There is, a need, there is no need for translation if he were to be translated, the effect and affect of his voice, of his chant, would be lost. So let's see. Um, let me show you. These are people going to their daily lives. Mm 
So what I find in this scene at the moment is that, uh, first of all, untranslatability here is, is required for us to feel the partial connection, to feel like that we are alongside with them in their walls and complaints about you know, the, what the World Bank and the IMF have done to Africa. <coughs> So therefore, we are partially connected to the African witnesses' worlds. I would say that it's not equivocal translation, but the sheer materiality of voice, in this case, it, to invoke the important work of Adriana Caravero on voice. I mean, the materiality of voice, how the voice sounds, and the chant, how the chant, the, the, you know, the pain in the chant, we don't need translation. And they don't understand either, but they feel partially connected. So, to uh, so the, it's the materiality of voice is what grants us this very much needed partial connections between different worlds and natures, cosmologies, ontologies, into, insofar as it allows us to, like Isabelle Stenger would say, slow down reasoning you know she has this notion of slow down reasoning coming to you know stop and seeing things in a different way and coming to a perception of something you know different is happening so it's slow down reason is this notion that we need to perceive things differently and I think that in this scene that I find wonderful it's an example of how we can see partial connections through the materiality of voice. And uh, so what I would like to see more and uh, what I like to see debates de de uh, evolving is about the colonial feminism and the Anthropocene and the need to uh, undermine the white imperial Western feminism that has you know, uh, become the articulator of the Anthropocene. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So have you heard about this Anthropocene before? Only vaguely, not yes. as well as, it was really helpful that you were that uh -huh. in the beginning. Because um, I think we had a general idea, but it was uh, good to hear your definition of it. Um, I was, can you talk more about, because uh, I, I really like your talk, I have so much to say about the, um, not just the decolonial feminist piece, but the indigenous piece. Um, because I, I found Jane Bennett's book great, but I think she comes at it obviously from this capitalist neoliberal yes. perspective and the language that she's using is almost as if she's discovered that now objects have agency exactly. and yeah. in the indigenous communities this has been going All on the forever. Time, yeah. So um, how, can, like, can you comment on what do you think the term does within indigenous settings or no, it's, it's exactly like the Anthropocene, the geologists came up with that term. Mm -hmm. And feminism are, you know, articulate uh, Anthropocene feminists. But exactly, 
what I've been reading, how Forrest Stink and mm -hmm. Nate and yeah. Philippe, Philippe Descola, Nature, the construct in Nature, it has been going on for years. Even Silvia Rivera Cusicani, yeah. yeah, the notion of Pachamama, Pachamama and everything, this has been always present in these indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's high time that the colonial feminists or theorists began you know, to intervene mm -hmm. in these debates, mm -hmm. that I find the universalizing mm -hmm. uh, thrust of the debate, we, who are, mm -hmm. who are you talking, who are the we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's right, and I've been reading all this about how, you know, trees and, 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 and rocks, and it's fascinating, mm -hmm. and it's like the Anthropocene of la lettre. Yeah, and it's a lesson on how to <laughs> deal with the environment in a very different way than, you know, uh, capitalism and the Western world has dealt. If you haven't read Carolyn Dean's work yet, she talks, she works on rocks, but it's yes, in yes, stone. Yes, yes, um, I've seen, and yes. And Jose Maria Arvelos's novels uh, are such a good example of this type of... Yeah, Dean is an art historian, isn't she? Yeah, she's a colonial art historian. She's at, U at UC Santa Cruz. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Carolyn, Carolyn Dean. Dean. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, how rocks, you know, also... Back then, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of <coughs> that. I have a student doing a PhD on bringing out, so this, you know, in literature, mm -hmm. this uh, fiction, you know, U Ursula, there is a, I forgot her last name, mm -hmm. is also very much cited by Haraway as mm -hmm. someone that already was dealing with the multiple relationalities mm -hmm. uh, between things and beings and animals and mm -hmm. no human and human. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot that we need to explore and bring and make that Anthropocene much more complex mm -hmm. than I've seen yeah. so far. Yeah, you know. great. Yeah. Thanks for the care of, you know, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I want, I, you know, there is a, they have it in Kindle book and I was going to buy it. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. This is, this is really, this is, this is really, it uh, sheds a lot of light on, on, on having a, a, fleshing out much more a, a dimension. I, I, I was thinking about the, the decolonial, Discussion in general, um, the the I mean I, I, I'm going back to the the, the moment in, in in which actually Lugones and Rita Laura Segato were not t uh, yet integrated into the conversation, and and <laughs> the people who were uh, speaking more about feminism in, in um, within the decolonial. Uh, that that moment of decolonial discussion, and, and when I talk about the decolonial discussion, I'm talking particularly about the people who started using that kind of language, Mignolo, uh, Quijano, uh, etc. And and uh, there were voices there like Arturo Escobar and and. Edgardo Lander, who who raised a critique of, of the lack of of, of uh, engagement with the ecological dimension, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and it, it's interesting because uh, among those people were the same kind of people who were bringing the the uh, feminist perspective, uh -huh. and, and and then you know the the it, it came out. Something that is is used like a slogan in Latin America, and, and, and I'm saying a slogan in in the bad sense of the word, mm -hmm. because this is a critical theory. And I mean, if we are yeah. at the level of critical theory, if you use certain uh, categories as slogans, it's very problematic. So now you have a lot of people in Latin America who talk about the coloniality of power, the coloniality of knowledge, and the coloniality of nature, nature. of being, and the coloniality of, of nature. nature. yes. As a kind of formula, no? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a kind of formula within which, uh, and you see like Kathy Wolf doing that, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, without any substance necessarily 
in the in the in the analysis. Okay. Of, of, so I mean, by that I mean that that you are bringing a lot of substance to to what is the ecological dimension of coloniality, and and it's interesting that in the in the feminist critique mm -hmm. part, the colonial feminism, uh, there has not been. Uh, an emphasis on the ecological question, and in that yeah. sense, it, part of it is, I, I'm, I'm thinking loudly now, it, the, the, there is a, an interest in affirming an, an intellectual and critical identity vis-a-vis -vis other people, so that is not a conversation with Donna Haraway and with all of that feminist uh, uh. discussion that is there yeah. that if you engage in that conversation then you do yes. what you are systematically doing here that is this breaking of that dichotomy exactly. between nature and culture subject object yes. yeah. uh, male female etc all of these binaries that is part of the critique in general that that that, that we are doing uh, so i mean it is 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 a this is this is really really important and, and, and I think that there has been an emphasis mostly uh, when you talk about decolonial feminism on, on the question of race mm -hmm. more than in intersectionality yes. or articulations uh -huh. of, of, uh -huh. of different mm -hmm. dimensions of okay. an ontology of power and an ontology of, of subjection and subjectivation, not self-affirmation yes. yes. in that sense. Uh, so I mean that's yeah. that's that's one thing that that was provoked by your talk. The other thing is that the the your emphasis on affect, which is you know, and 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 here is here is I think an interesting contrast. Those people who want to overdo the difference between the decolonial and the postcolonial, who then will not really recognize the importance of, of postcolonial feminists, of women of color, there were women, you know, stuff done by lots of people, by uh, Chandra Mohanty, uh -huh. etc. Which, when what is what is the the analytics and the politics of of what is decolonial and or what is decolonization? It's interesting that the language itself of decolonial is coming out of Chicano feminism. Uh -huh. It's yes. not coming out decolonial of Latin America. Voice. Some people want to make us believe. It's coming from, you know, yeah. Emma Perez Emma and, and, and uh, Chela Sandoval, etc. Mm -hmm. And and there is an, an, an intimate dimension which is part of any feminist discourse, no, by by definition, that is also missing mm -hmm. in a lot of the decolonial fe uh, feminism. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, 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 the more personal, to mm -hmm. put it like that, in that, yeah. that language, the more personal dimension mm -hmm. of of what is uh, oppression and what is liberation, what what will uh, entail decolonization of the self, and then all of that dimension of affect uh, and the aesthetic dimension yeah. also that you are bringing yeah. here, all of these things I think are missing there and and will really enrich the the, the discussion. Yeah, just as well, just to, to okay to, to compliment, I think. One of the things that's true, I mean, you mentioned, you, you quickly referenced someone you referred to as an, an echo feminist. And it strikes me that there's that kind of uh, silence also in, you know, as if de decolonial feminism has been colonized by Latin Americans or something, mm -hmm. in, in the, to the extent that there isn't dialogue, for instance, with South Asians, both. Um, Post-colonial feminists, but also eco-feminists, like yes, you know, mm -hmm. historically, yeah. you know, yeah, important much. exactly. Who you know, and and so part of the question would be to what extent does that route to the Anthropocene? You know, it's an earlier literature, so it's not necessarily yeah. directed at that. But to what extent might that be a helpful path yeah. to look yes. at? You know, not not U.S. eco-feminists. Um, who are who talk about a we uh, yeah. universalizing we, yeah. but but something yeah. like Shiva or others. Yeah, um, yeah, that's exactly. And but one of the, this is important to explore if that route is being taken or not. Uh, it's not being taken right now, but it's a possibility. But the other thing that I find 
uh, difficult in you know, all the decolonial uh, theorists uh, about epistemologists that anything that Western is of no use. You know, the four uh, cavaleros do apocalipse, it's like they da Foucault and like for uh, uh, some of the colonial theorists, okay? So everything that is Western is tainted so it doesn't serve. And that's where I want to, like in feminism, like you said, put Donna Haraway in conversation with what the colonial feminists are trying to do, and you see lots of possibilities. Because the important thing is, yes, we need to undo the binary nature culture, but what happens when we undo that binary? That's the most important question. What happens to think of ourselves as in partial connection with this chair, with this, you know, this the air that is circulating here, and to explore that, to, you know, the fantastic work by being done by Karen Barra, Stacy <coughs> Alimo, and all, all these other feminists that could be put in dialogue. We have to dialogue with them and Western knowledge, even to even if it's to undermine it, but not say we can't do because if we deal with Western, you know, discourses, or then it's tainted. It's not the colonial. That's the problem I see in Mignolo's position, for mm -hmm. instance. You know, but we need to, but like practices, there are lots of ethnography about the groups doing, you know, sustainable agriculture. Uh, like, you know, I think that Arturo mm. has studied, you know, the black population, the Colombian Pacific, and so there's a lot of wonderful but we need also to intervene in the theoretical debates. We need to intervene in the conference on the Anthropocene feminism with these other voices, you know, so that we can halt the universalizing we and whiteness of the discourses. And another thing that bothers me is that when you go and read this paper about, you know, the unbounded body, transcorporeality, it's so esoteric, it's so difficult to follow because it becomes like, you know, so we need also to develop discourse that are not as esoteric and even other practice like aesthetic practices that, you know, this artist was developing that I criticized. Chanting in the classroom is something I like to do. Huh? <laughs> Chanting in the classroom. Yes. <laughs> 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 and, you know, the tricks for the affective dimension of, you know, other ways of telling the story, you know, so. Uh, chanting, why not? Probably we move much more <laughs> students, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to start my classes with the Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then the so this is always to do that. He always see? had music on at the beginning of his lectures. Yeah. Was the ice artist also? Was that I didn't? I was didn't. Was that Stacy Alimo also? <laughs> <laughs> Who was this, the artist? No, no, the artist is Kir uh, Kirsten <laughs> Jentison, okay. and she's analyzed by Stacy. A limo? A limo, I don't, yeah, I okay. don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, in her paper on insurgent vulnerabilities. And that artist is where she from, the ice artist. Oh. I'm just curious. <laughs> by, the, by, the, by the lights of it, she seems to be from Iceland. Claudia, I was... I, I was might have had a question. Mm. Yeah, you have to check uh, where she <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to hear more about what you were talking about at the end of your talk uh, in regards to voice. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in the, in the, you know, in the status of voice and what it does for our, you know, conceptualization of feminist agency or a feminist conceptualization of agency. Uh -huh. um, because I see that oftentimes voice is conflated with agency, and mm. I am interested in questions of, you know. The posthuman might open a, a door to not only um, break with the um, dichotomy between the human and the non-human, but mm -hmm. also to look at the human in 
in much more complex ways, or you know, human agency in, in a yeah. much more. Yes, exactly. Uh, what I think, uh, I mean, Adriani, if you're interested in voice, there is this m masterpiece by Adriani Cavarero mm -hmm. that she works exactly on voice. There are some critiques because, you know, she says the voice of the, the baby hears the voice of the mother. There is some kind of uh, mm -hmm. motherhood a little bit that bothers <laughs> me in her work. But she has a <laughs> wonderful... <laughs> She has a wonderful, uh, she theorizes voice mm -hmm. and how voice, the materiality of voice and how that is able to uh, circumvent mm -hmm. any notion of semiotic, linguistic language, you know, it's just how voice moves us mm -hmm. aside from meaning because there is one moment that we have to, you know, stop the, uh, get rid of the language framework, linguistic framework. Everything is language, you know. There is something that is outside language. Mm -hmm. And I like that piece, that moment in the movie, because it was the only moment there were no subtitles. We didn't know what he was saying, but was it necessary to know what he was saying? Or just hearing the, the lament in the chant was enough. So this is one moment that we don't need for to be moved for, you know, meaning. It's mm -hmm. go beyond meaning. And the post-human, that, that, you know, that hybrid, the human, non-human hybrid that is supposed to, of course, opens up to all kinds of other, you know, views of agency, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, ma materials, rocks, are actants in the world have agency as well, and uh, snow. <laughs> exactly. no, what? snow, snow, yeah. snow has a like you know how is snow like my arm and a shovel is snow, you know how snow has agency in my arm. And there are lots of things, and for instance, like human non human. How we, we talk, Sonia and I, we talk with the dogs, you know, with the animals. And they talk back. And they talk back. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's so, it, it's, the, the, the world becomes so more interested. As soon as we, we get out outside of, you know, humanism and the discourse on humanism and humanity. I remember in Laza, we met Mary Pratt. And she had gone to a conference at UCSC all about this. And she came back and said, yes, you know, uh, uh